how are you? Um, in this tiny video refresher, um, I wanted to talk very quickly about the importance of legal professional privilege, or as the Australian Law Reform Commission calls it and tells us that we should call it client legal privilege. Um, client legal privilege is so important that Justice Kirby once referred to it as being an important human right requiring protection as such. And one of the major swings over the last 400 years, didn't happen quickly, is that legal privilege moved from being something that belonged to the lawyer to becoming something that is very much the right of the client now. So legal professional privilege fits in uh, two of the duties that we need to follow. Uh, firstly, it's an important part of the administration of justice. Uh, so our primary duty in the hierarchy of duties is our duty to obey the law and our duties to the court. But the key duty, the one that's in everybody's faces all the time and we spent most of our time talking about, is the duty that we have to the client. And where we can do our best to act zealously for the benefit of our client without breaching our obligations to the court or to uphold the law, then that's what we should be doing. And so the duty is not only to keep information confidential, but in particular the duties of legal professional privilege fall out of our duties of loyalty to our clients. And some of you will remember that really difficult case study that I shared with you um, about Alton Logan, uh, the gentleman in the US who was found guilty of a crime that he didn't commit. But the lawyers for the person who committed the crime were in a position where they really couldn't share that information. And I think that's one of the best examples of how uh, legal professional privilege or client legal privilege works uh, and the complexities and the ethical dilemmas that arise. So what do you need to be able to know about it? Firstly, you need to understand the rationale behind legal professional privilege and be in a position to share your point of view as to whether that rationale is justified, what you think you might do in those situations, or to advise potentially a lawyer who is in a position where they're in, um, they need to work out whether or not information is or is not subject to the privilege and whether or not it needs to be released. So you need to understand what the exceptions to the rule are and you need to understand how it operates in practice. Um, it's really useful to stand back from the rule as well and to recognise that while all, almost all information that is provided to you in your capacity as a lawyer will be confidential, uh, not all confidential information will also be subject to client legal privilege. So you will need to be able to differentiate be between the two and understand what the differences are and why the differences matter. So when it comes to confidentiality, so the bigger area, which covers all of the information uh, that is provided or confidential information that is provided, um, the source of that duty comes from a number of places. Most importantly, and often most overlooked, is the contract of retainer. So the contractual obligation or the contractual promises that a lawyer makes when they take on a client, whether that's as a solicitor or a barrister. Um, and so the contractual promises last for as long as the contract lasts. lasts. Now, the contract itself might require that uh, confidentiality to extend a further amount of time. Uh, but it is a contractual promise and as a consequence a breach of that contract is something that uh, the client can sue for um, if, if the lawyer has breached their obligation of confidence. Um, then there's also the fiduciary relationship or the equitable doctrine of confidentiality that really springs out of the uh, lawyer's duty of loyalty to their client. Um, so this is particularly key and 
effectively has been codified by the professional conduct rules. So you need to be able to identify what the relevant conduct rules are. And here we're talking about Australian Solicitor Conduct Rule 9, 9.1, 9.2. And we also, it may be relevant to have a look at the Barrister's Rule number 63. Then when it comes to that smaller group of um, communications that will need to be confidential, um, but then may also be subject to privilege, you need to understand the public policy benefits for having um, legal professional privilege or client privilege. Um, and again, you need to have a point of view. Um, information is really easy to find and gather. What demonstrates to us that you understand and that you have are amassing the skills that you need to become a lawyer is your ability to synthesize that, to have a point of view, to think about the complexities and understand how it works. The relevant law here too will be the Evidence Act 2008. Uh, so sections 118 and 119 are most relevant to privilege uh, in a general sense, but it's also worth being comfortable that you've had a look at section 131A as well, which deals with the pre-trial processes. So at common law, there are two relevant limbs. Here. So when we're thinking about privilege, there are two relevant limbs, advice privilege and litigation privilege. So what's the difference between them? In a nutshell, you're going to need to be able to share that. But um, essentially, advice privilege is the protection of communications between a client and their lawyer for the purposes of the lawyer providing advice. And litigation privilege uh, is the protection of communications between a client, a lawyer and some other third party, if relevant, where the dominant pur purpose of the communication is uh, to address an anticipated or existing legal proceeding. So in order to identify whether information is or is not privileged, you'll need to be able to understand the dominant purpose test, and it's a complex test. The key case here is ESSO and the Commissioner of Taxation. And at risk of vastly oversimplifying, um, the test asks you to identify whether information is confidential because only communications that are confidential, um, that they need to be made for the dominant purpose of securing legal advice for use in existing or reasonably anticipated litigation. So we need it to be confidential we need the dominant purpose to be related to the legal advice in relation to existing or reasonably anticipated litigation. So if you have your head around all of that, you'll be really well placed to address questions that arise in relation to legal professional privilege. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing whether there's a question about legal professional privilege or not on your exam. All the best with it. As always, if you've got questions, concerns, frustrations, or even compliments, you know where to find us. Cheers.